Bible faith is the substance you live with until the manifestation of the answer to your prayer. Faith is something you hold on to until the answer comes. Faith in God is the prerequisite to receiving something from God. Faith in God looks to the future, to the future, to the answer to your prayer with confidence and optimism. Doubt is an enemy to the believer. And so we promote faith in God above fear and apprehension, I mean worry about the future. So the optimum designation and destination of biblical faith is to get the word of God indelibly inscribed in our hearts. I've been trying, I've been struggling to teach that there is a difference between just getting it in your mind. That's, that could be positive thinking. Nothing wrong with that. It serves its purpose in the natural. But it's different than Bible faith. Bible faith has to go through the mind, but it has to penetrate into the heart. Can you get it? Matthew 12, 24, this is a quintessential, a quintessential truth. Pray my mouth is dry here, help me pray. How, let's do, help, do this with me, let's try it. How now brown cow, okay. Matthew 12, 24 is a quintessential truth that I want you to get, so let's read it please right now. Blood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. That's why we make such an emphasis that yes, you have to hear it, yes, you have to speak it, but you have to pray that the Holy Spirit will cause us to deposit in your heart because out of the heart, man speaketh. Can you say amen? Out of the heart, that's how, how it happens. So this quest centers then around discovering the best mythology, the best way to get this infrangible, inexorable truth permanently dis deposited in our hearts. I'm gonna go over Romans 12, one and two with you again, because it has to start in changing of the mind. Let's look at it. <clears throat> I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, which is your reasonable service. Now watch this part. Do not be conformed to this world, Obviously, there's a danger of being conformed to the idiom, to the culture of this world. It's because everybody else is doing it, so to speak. And it's easy to flow with the flow, go with the flow, as they say. And if you're not careful, you'll go with the wrong flow and head in the wrong direction. Let's read this together without comment. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, perfect will of God. So we have to work at it. Now let's look at it in the Amplified because it really does the job. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, dedicating all of yourself set apart as a living sacrifice, holy, well-pleasing to God, which is your rational, logical, intelligent act of worship. Do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs. Boy, this does the job, doesn't it? But be transformed and progressively, God never said you just do it overnight, progressively change as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values, ethical attitudes, so that you may prove for yourself what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. You just can't spell it out any more clear. 
Now, it may seem to you that that's a, a, a laborious attempt. You have to work hard at it, going through the reorientation of the mind. But that's really what has to happen. Your mind has to be altered. It has to be changed. I call it being retrofitted, but it's more than being retrofitted. It has to be cleansed, and God has to heal your mind because it's going in the wrong direction, wrong precepts, wrong beliefs, wrong attitudes. And so we have to go through this. And through the arduous, it may be arduous in coming, but it's worth the effort. Faith in God is not just a model. Faith in God moves mighty mountains. Are you in this place today? Let's look at Hebrews 11. I believe Brother Dana mentioned this scripture, and you can't help but preach on faith without using 11.6 of the book of, uh, of Hebrews. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must first believe, that is, and secondly, that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Now let's take a look at another verse that I brought up last week, and that's Proverbs chapter 6, verse number 2. And let's see how, you know, here's the thing. I keep trying to tell you where we ought to go, then I'm trying to show you how to get there. Amen. I want to teach you step by step how you get there. Now look at this, this warning here. You can jump back and forth, Old and New Testament, you'll see we'll do that today. You are snared. How I many you know if you're snared, you're caught in a trap? Yep. You are snared by the words of your mouth. You are taken by the words of your mouth. So we have to understand that faith begins in your mouth. Clean up your mouth and you're on your way to having biblical faith. Stop the nonsensical negativity that comes out of your mouth every single day of your life. They'll never make it. Do you see those characters criticizing your neighbor, criticizing them, making fun, everything you see, you, you know. It's just a total negative way of working. I'll never make it. Boy, I wish I could do what they did. I wish I could get that job. I'll probably never get that. I'll never get that boss, that dumb boss. Well, don't worry about that dumb boss. If you pray and believe God, that dumb boss may be transferred somewhere else, maybe to, to newcomers down or somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> Not be raiding newcomers down. Boy, you got to watch in this place. People hang you up to dry, I'm telling you. So the substance of faith is such an important issue. The Bible teaches that we, in a way, have two sets of ears, one inside and the other outside. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 3, verses 3 to 6. I'll give you a lot of scripture because that's where faith is in the word. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Now watch this. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Talk about instruction. And so find, as a result, so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. So I believe that if people hear the word in churches across not only America, but across the world, and many of them just here it goes in and one ear and comes out the other. How do you even know it is the word if you're not really listening? How do you know someone's not shading the word with their own opinion, with their own ideas? How do you know if you keep following somebody who is shading the word if you're not going to get off track? How do you know these things? By getting into the word yourself. That's what I found even as a minister. I heard everybody and their brother. I was, you know, I, I, I just, I've been around this for a long time. You have to appreciate it. I've been through so many moves. You, you know, you take me back. Do you realize it started in the 40s with me? I was just a little kid, and my dad heard William Branham, and he wanted to hear him in person, and William Branham came to Cleveland, and my sister, my oldest sister, Helen, was willing to go, and I said, I want to go. 
And I got in the car with him. We went and heard William Branham, one of the most anointed, unusual ministry I've ever seen in all, all my life. But nonetheless, the hunger began to develop to hear the truth. And Oral Roberts came on the scene. And all kinds of ministries began to come. The Voice of Healing Ministries came on. We've heard of early rain, latter rain. Every kind of movement imaginable came on the scene. So I've been able to be parts of them and observe them. And then I came to the realization, I have to get into the book for myself. I can't just use somebody's outline. They said this, they said that. Good for them. I have to know what thus saith the Lord says to me. I have to have that personal experience for myself. How can I be of aid or help to someone else if I cannot even find help for myself? And so that's the track I've been on. So how do we go about writing things on our heart? Notice how these scriptures are leading us this direction. The psalmist David instructs us on how. Let's go to Psalms, uh, the 45th chapter, and the latter part. We'll read it all. My heart is overflowing with good theme. I recite my composition concerning the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. You can write on your heart with the tongue because it's like a pen. So you got to speak it so you hear it. You got to hear it so it penetrates into your heart so you can really become a believer and not just a surface believer, but a real down to earth believer. Last week I gave you another scripture. Some of these scriptures, I just can't help it. I go over them. Joshua 1 and 8. So you can watch. We can hop from back and forth, New and Old Testament. Joshua 1 8 says, This book of the law, notice how important this book of the law, the, the word, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. Yes, people will think you're a bug and they'll think you're an extremist. You turn, turn on to the Lord and you'll see how fast some of your friends will say, uh, I think we have to go home. <laughs> you know, you start getting too much into the Lord, you'll see even family members who are unsaved are saying, I think you better go now. <laughs> you won't be very welcome anymore. But you meditate a day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein and that you may make it your, that then it will make your way prosperous, read with me, and then you will have good success. You notice it's a following. There's always a, there's always a condition and then something follows when you do what the Bible says. Let's go to another scripture. I'm going to read a whole bunch of verses here. Let's go to the 28th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. I want to just read to you. Now, now notice these promises, though in order to get them to work in the Old Testament, they required a whole different set of rules, set of laws. The New Testament, we live under the law of faith, but the promises are still there. It's how you implement them, how you get them to go. Now look at this 28th chapter. And it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you, your, set, set you high above all nations of the world. Pretty lofty. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed, he goes on and on, shall be in your city. Blessed shall you be in the country. So whether you live in south of Navarre or north of uh, about... 70, whatever it is. <laughs> I got to watch what I say. See, if I say farmers, and you know, I, I, you got to be very careful. They'll think I'm de desecrated. Now, last week, I happened to mention if you were to something, to do something about it. But I covered it by saying, I have something I struggle with, and I have to do something about it. So you have to do something to lessen. I have to do something to increase. Now, if we could get together, we could make a deal. You decrease and I'll increase and we'll both be happy. Now, I, I didn't think you'd be happy about my comments. I'm trying to learn. I'm young at this. Just be, go along with the poor guy, please. 
All right, let's go on. Let's go. Verse 5. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed you shall be when you come in. Blessed you shall be when you go out. This goes on. Verse 8. The Lord's command, his command is blessings on you and in your storehouses, man, to which you set your hand, he will bless you. Bless your hand. Just go right on down through there. Let's go to the 10th verse. Then all peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord. It goes on in verse 13, uh, verse 11, rather, and the Lord will grant you plenty of goods. Oh, I thought the Lord was cheap when you were live in poverty and hang down your head like what you, what did you say he was, Brother Dan, in the morning service? Hang, you remember that. You act like you didn't know it this morning. I heard you. I listened to it. You see, you remember, hang down your head, Tom Dooley, and you know that song. Um, all right, I got to get on with this because I have too much fun preaching to you. And let's go verse 13. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. Boy, and you shall be above only and not beneath. If you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and are careful to observe them, so shall you, you see, so shall you not turn aside from any of my words, which I command you this day to the right hand or to the left, but to, or to go with any other gods. Same thing applies in the New Testament. The difference is we live by the law of faith and not by the law of works. The Old Testament, you could get those benefits, but here's the point. Those benefits were available. What needed to happen? You had to meet the requirements. And that's what happens in the new. If we're going to receive, we receive by faith. So we have to learn to trust him no matter what the circumstance. And remember, about the words, Genesis chapter 1, verses all the way down through 33, 31. If you read all the verses, and God said, God said, there was light, God said. Now notice, there was Darkness, there was water, there was the Holy Spirit brood. There were things there, but until God said and spoke, when he said, separate the light from the darkness, boom, boom, there it came. Poo, yeah. hallelujah. Amen. What you doing, Lex? Say it either. <laughs> Praise God. You can't help but sometimes your physical body begins to react to the Holy Spirit. So the spiritual force of faith, which is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen, comes as a result of hearing the word. We got to hear the word. Since faith is a spiritual substance, the word must process through the inner spiritual ear. Romans 10, 17, how does faith come? Then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I make the statement sometime that I believe that when people begin to speak it themselves, it's one thing, you hear me speak, I don't doubt you get inspired, you hear me say something from the word of God under the anointing. But I wanna tell you when you are studying for yourself and your own heart hears your mouth speak, your own ears hear your mouth, and it gets dead, it penetrates down into your heart. And pretty soon, you don't have to try to believe. You're just a faith person. Amen. Hallelujah. Something has happened way down deep inside. I believe that the force of faith will materialize more quickly and be more profound if you speak the word with your own mouth. Right. Your spiritual ear will send it directly to your heart. Again, back to Psalm 45, verse 1, David says, My tongue is the pen of the ready writer. So watch what your tongue says. That's how you get it into your heart. So this, there's a matter of perhaps heart deception. Now here's a little warning here. James in chapter 1, verse 26. If anyone among you thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. So you have to watch what you say, and you better mean what you say. Otherwise, you're not going to be 
appreciate it for sure. Here James warns of the imperative significance of the tongue. It's not easy to bridle the tongue. It's easier to criticize than it is to brag on someone. The next time you feel like criticizing someone, I dare you just to force yourself. You might have to force yourself at first because you're in such a bad habit. Just force yourself. You're just going to call somebody up and tell them off. Call them and say, you know what? <laughs> you was on my mind today. That's what you know I was thinking about you. <laughs> I was thinking that scripture in, 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 Jeremiah, in Jeremiah where it says, you know, my plans for you. I, I can hear you thinking and saying two different things. And I was thinking of you, my plans for you, as you'd die right in your own shoes. <laughs> No, no, my, my, the, the Lord's plan for you is good. It's hard because there is a conflict within us. If it was easy, anybody could do it. But we can stand firm if we'll just allow ourselves to, to learn as we go. So he warns us that we have to be careful. If we're not careful, our tongue will condemn us and we'll go backwards instead of forward. The heart gets deceived when misinformation reaches the inner spiritual ear. I mean, you, you have to appreciate you're not perfect. Any part of you is perfect. So even your inner ear, which is a spiritual ear, if you come across so sincere that you believe some, there may be error in what you believe, but you've deceived your own conscience. You've deceived your own heart. Can you see how dangerous this is if you don't get a hold of your mouth, get a hold of your conversa conversation, get a hold of how you feel toward other people? I know it's too practical. I wish I could think of something that would tickle your ears, but I just can't think of anything right now. The heart gets deceived when misinformation reaches the inner spiritual ear because this acts as the voice of the Spirit. How does your inner, inner ear know? See, all this has to be trained. You have to be trained in the Word of God. Let's go to Mark chapter 4. Let me go over something with you. This is a parable of the sower. But we're going to pick up where Jesus don't do this often, by the way. He'll give a parable. He doesn't often come right back and explain what the parable means. He lets that up to you. He makes you think it out. But in this case, the parable of the sower, you can read that in the first part. But as you go down here now into, into the 14th, chapter, 14th verse, he explains the sower. He says, the sower sows the word. Now watch this. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. You've seen a lot of people like this. When they hear, Satan comes immediately, takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. They've had such bad training, such bad ideas about the Lord. Immediately, the devil takes it away from them. These, likewise, are the ones sown on stony ground. Now, here's another type of people. When they hear the word, immediately they receive it with gladness. You've seen people, oh, yeah, yeah, let's go. And they have no root in them, themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, then immediately they stumble. Now, you've seen that. It's, we're talking about two different classes already. We already learned these two classes that live on the wrong premise, wrong ethics. All right? Now, there are, these are the ones sown among thorns. There's another type of people. And these are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world. Oh, my God, I just can't take it. I can't stand it. The deceitfulness of riches. Man, I've never had anything in my life. Man, I can't buy enough stuff. And the desires for other things entering in the choke off the word. And it becomes unfruitful. Three different classifications of people you've known or do know who have come and heard the gospel, responded in one, one way or another, and fell by the wayside. But these are the ones sown on good ground. Listen carefully. Only 25% of Christians who hear the word of God as you hear it today get it. 
Do you get it? Those who hear the word accept it and bear fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. If I'm correct in the way I look at that parable, that means only 25% of Christians that are in good evangelical churches that hear the gospel really get it. Does that tell you why it's so difficult to have revival today? No, you I do appreciate that I have it put in my opinion there. But you have, a, a, you, have, you have the right to give an educated opinion if you've looked at the Word of God and let it speak for itself. Yeah, yeah. Speaks in f three different categories that failed. Yeah. They got affected by the Word, they heard the Word, they responded to this, that, and then several th different things mentioned and how they're about their demise. Only one group of people really got it. I think that's dangerous. So I just thought I'd remind you of it. <laughs> I knew you would be really happy to hear that. The incorruptible seed. The Word of God is pre-programmed to succeed. That's why we got to get the Word. Amen. I said we got to get the Word. That's why we must speak the Word, hear the Word, believe the Word. Your words count. You count. You matter. What you speak out of your mouth matters. You're not some just some whimsical fly-by-night walking through life. You're neither here nor there, hither or yon. No, you're somebody with a purpose. You say, I'm not good-looking enough. God never looked at you and thought whether you're good-looking or not. He made you as a human being and you fit. I said you fit. It's necessary for you to be here. No one can replace you. No one even has the same fingerprints you have. No one in the entire world. That's beyond my ability to comprehend. Yes, you're different, but you belong to God. Rise up in who you are. Stop trying to be somebody else. My Lord, in my first part of the ministry, I, I think people wondered who they was preaching to. Sometime I sounded like Oral Roberts. Be healed, rise up, be made whole. I tried to sound like him. Other, other ministers, I didn't know any better. I'd been to school. Of course, I learned, uh, uh, you know, all the how, what homiletics meant and all the teachings of the, of the Word. But style-wise, finally, God said, just be yourself. I didn't even know people would even accept me being myself. And as you can tell, a lot of people don't. <laughs> oh, praise God. Well, I'm not trying to make excuses, folks. I'm not trying to excuse myself, but it's just the way it is. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12, the way I get out of trouble. You notice what I do, jump right back into the scriptures. I don't trust my, my, my you never mind. It's just a... I did. I know how, what I was. What was he going to say? I was going to say I don't trust my rat, rattle brain. But I can't say that because I don't have a rattle brain. I'm convinced. I'm. Con <laughs> All right. Now wait. Let's, let's go on. This is good stuff. See, maybe you get it better if I have a little fun with you. I don't know. I just do the best I can with what I have to work with. <laughs> Matthew twelve thirty three. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad, and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Let's read on. Blood of vipers, how can you be an evil? Speak good things, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil things. But I say to you that every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. Is it important what you say or not? Am I just making this up, trying to make life difficult for you? The kingdom of God that is within you, we know the kingdom of God is with you, mentioned to us in Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21, is fed by the Word of God. 
You have to have the word. Of, if you're not in a good church where you're hearing the word of God, say, I don't know what church to go. Get in one that preaches the word. I've got people that watch us on television that have tried their best to get the word in their area. And they say, Brother Dave, we just can't get it. We sit home and watch you. Yeah, and they send their tithes to me because there's that's where they're being fed. Well, if the dumb preachers in their own area would preach the word, they'd put the tithe there. I didn't tell them to put the tithe in me. Help me, Jesus. See, right away, you just get out of sorts with me. The king, there's a supply in the king. Look at, look at Philippians chapter 4. With, that's why I stick with the word because when I face these kind of problems, I can quote the word at the devil. He fears that more than anything. Look at Philippians 4, 19. We'll read it in, in King James first. And my God, my God. See, my God gets very personal. Shall supply. Not that he might under certain conditions. It says, and my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Here's the Amplified, same verse. And my God will literally supply Fill to the full. That's satiate. Satiation, that's what that is. Fill to the full every need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> God will operate through his kingdom which is within you. No, you're not that the kingdom of God is within you. You don't realize how close you are to God and how available, if you make yourself available, how much God can do in you and through you and by you. I just love it. God will operate his kingdom within you. God will, that food in the, in the human spirit works the same as food in the natural. If you get good food in the spiritual, you grow spiritually. Praise God, you start developing some spiritual muscles inside. I said muscles. <clears throat> See, right away, I... I read minds. I can't help it. I don't try to. I just see it. I hear what you thought. I didn't say it, so just forget about it. All right, back where I was. So food in the spiritual, just the same as natural food that you assimilate into your body, produces strength. Spiritual food is assimilated in your spirit, and it produces a substance called faith. A substance called faith. As a born-again believer, we are of all people most fortunate. God has made the substance of faith available to us, allowing us to achieve greatness.